with everyone in the world with their own view. Ever wonder if God has a view? And, and that's what the show's all about. What's God's view versus our view? Topics that affect our daily life. Empowering and inspiring. Right to develop a heart, a kingdom mindset, you know. It's a because God does have a view. Your host, Dr. Trudy Simmons, The Christian View. Hi, and welcome to The Christian View. I'm your host, Dr. Trudy. Thank you for our great audience today. We love having our audience, and thank you for inviting us into your home. We take today's hot and challenging topics and weigh it against the Word of God because God does have a view. And I believe now more than ever, His Word needs to be out on the airways as much as possible. So thank you again for inviting us into your home. Um, today, I have the privilege of sitting with Daryl Stinson. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. It's an honor. You, I know you just flew in from New York so to be here. So thank you for that. Um, let me tell the audience just a little bit about you, and then I just want you to chime in. But you're an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. You're a pastor. You're a speaker and you're a suicide survivor. Mm. And to me, that just speaks volume because you've been through the valleys and you've been on the mountaintops. So let's just talk about the valley first and then get to the mountaintop. Just straight for the valley. Yes. yes. Oh, gosh. Um, man, so I played football at Central Michigan University. I was actually a top 100 athlete. Okay. And uh, originally from Jackson, Michigan. What that meant for me is that. I was going to be successful. Being a professional athlete is how I was going to get my family out of the hood. Right. I was going to be rich and famous. Um, I grew up in church, but I fell away, and I was actually agnostic for a good chunk of my life. I didn't believe in organized religion. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was supposed to go to the NFL, Right. and I got hurt, had back surgery. Oh, okay. Um, at the end of my true freshman year. At the end of your freshman year, you got hurt and had I back did. surgery. I did, had back wow. surgery. Okay, had so to things have a, changed. Oh, big time. Yes. I mean, the rug got ripped right from right. under me. Uh, but since sports wasn't what I did, it was who I was, it was my identity, right. I couldn't just let it go. And I always tell people, like, whenever your identity is attached to something external, um, you'll make poor decisions. Right. You'll always do what has that thing's best interest in mind, that relationship, that career's best interest, rather than your own. Right. And so that's what I did. It was better for me to play hurt mm -hmm. because I was better than the next guy fully healthy. Right. Okay. Even after the back surgery. Even after the back surgery because I was just, I was good like that. Right. <laughs> you just worked through the pain. Well, opioids. Okay. Um, so it started as like, hey, I'm just going to take a lot of painkillers, right. numb my physical pain to play the game of football. Right. And at some point, I'm just going to make it, and then I'll find some doctor who can heal me, was my mindset at the time. Right. Still not a Christian at that time. Still not a Christian at that time. Okay. Like, anti-Christian. Right. I always tell people, like, I talk people out of the faith that I now talk them into. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely anti. I didn't want anything to do with that. Um, and, you know, long story short, it just, um, I, I lasted for about two years okay. um, through opioids and some different things, and we can dive in if you want to. Uh, but ultimately, I started to take so many opioids that it was thinning my blood to the point where every time I made contact on the field, my nose would bleed. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's so, serious. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. coaches saw that. And okay. then I was telling them it was allergies, and they were like, it's not allergies. Right. So they kicked me off the team, and I was forced to face... Like I was forced to face the fact that I didn't know who I was outside mm -hmm. of athletics. Right. I had no identity outside of my career. Right. And so that, no foundation in Christ, no identity in Christ, um, shook up my world. And yeah. um, I had a lot of people that surrounded me. They liked me for my gift. Right. But they didn't like me for me. For you. And so when I was no longer playing sports, nobody really saw me. And I got depressed. Right. And I started to, uh, to use the opioids not for physical pain, mm -hmm. but to numb my emotional right. pain that my career was over. Right. And rejection from all the people that you thought were your friends yes. were now rejecting oh, you. Oh, my gosh, yeah. yes. Totally. You know, right. like, how, how, how's it going, Stance? How's yeah. your family? What's going on? Ask me about the games. Always interested mm -hmm. in my life. Not going to the league anymore. It's like I didn't even exist anymore. Right, right. And then I had a girlfriend who I was dating for four and a half years, left me and got engaged to another man. Wow. And so it was just like rejection after rejection yeah. after rejection. And I said, see, no one really loves me for me. They just love me for my gift. Right. And so ultimately I started to toy around with suicide, mm -hmm. you know, started to try to overdose on pills, get in car accidents, just really living recklessly because I wanted to end my life. Right. And um, I'll, I'll share this story here because this will be good for the audience. Right. But um, my last suicide attempt, I was in a vehicle. And I drank a fifth of alcohol, I mm -hmm. smoked a blunt, and I wrote my suicide letter um, saying goodbye to everyone mm -hmm. I love. And my plan was to drive off of 
a road onto an intersecting highway and end it. Right. So I start heading 75 miles per hour down a 35 mile per hour road and I'm white knuckling fist, mad, angry at the world. And in the middle of that, my mother, who didn't even know what was going on, right. but had that m mama, Holy Spirit right. intuition. Was, was she a believer at the time? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah oh yeah, oh yeah, praying mom. Yes. They say yes. if you have a praying mother or a praying grandmother, good luck trying to be a sinner because <laughs> it's, it's, it's not gonna work. <laughs> right. And so I'm in the middle of this, white knuckle fist, right. driving down this road, angry at the world. My phone is actually on silent, I see it ringing, it's my mom calling me, and she convinced me in the middle of my last suicide attempt to come to her to get help. Right. So she admitted me into a psychiatric care facility and it was there my life changed forever. So what happened? Man, um, my eyes were swollen shut. Okay. I couldn't open them, but just a slit. Mm -hmm. A woman with green pants comes in and says, Daryl, I don't know who you are. I don't have jurisdiction to be back here in this part of the hospital. Right. But God sent me to you to Amen. say, you need to say yes to him. Amen. But my heart was so hard. Right. Um, I didn't believe in that. Mm -hmm. How was God going to heal my back? How was that going to bring back my career or my girlfriend? It wasn't going to do any of that. Right. So I remember saying, just leave me alone. I just want to die. Mm. She left. My grandmother had drove from an hour and a half away from Jackson to Detroit. She came in. Um, she's a praying grandmother. And right. she said, hey, I've been praying for you all the way here. God told me, you know exactly what to do. You need to say yes to him. Amen. Same command. Right, right. Two different people yes. who didn't talk to each other. Right. And I couldn't deny that it was God, but my heart was still so hard. Mm -hmm. I said, Grandma, that's your God. That's your God. Right. And all I know how to describe it is that Grandma prayed for me for about five minutes. She backed away. It was so heavy, so depressed. It felt like wet blankets was in the room. And I heard that still small voice speak to me and say, Daryl, will you say yes to me? Wow, that is amazing. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with more here on The Christian View. Don't go away. the Christian View. We're talking today with Daryl Stinson. Thank you so much. Your testimony is so powerful. And I know that the Lord uses that, your testimony, to change lives. And so when we went to break before, you had just spoke about your encounter with the Holy Spirit yeah. inside a hospital. Can we yeah. take a take from there? Totally. He said, Daryl, um, will you say yes to me? Mm -hmm. And there was something about hearing my father's voice that gave me the strength to just like mutter out a, yes, Lord. Right. The moment I said that, the depression that I was under for years literally left. Um, my eyes actually got healed. That's right. how I could open them because um, they were swollen shut from mm -hmm. crying. It felt so good. I didn't know what else to do. I just kept screaming, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, <laughs> right. Lord. Just the freedom. Oh, just man. Just the freedom. Totally. Yes, because oh. the enemy had you in bondage for totally. all those years through lies and addiction and rejection. And, yeah. and the Lord set you free. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And it was amazing. And it felt so good. I mean, I just kept screaming it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Doctor comes in the room and he's like, what's going on? I remember I'm in the psychiatric unit getting ready to get admitted into the whole right. place. And he's like, what's going on? I was like, I was running from God and I just said yes to him. He <laughs> said, let's hurry up and get this guy upstairs. <laughs> Right. So don't say that because they might put you in right. the Right, they may think okay. something different than you actually crazy. set free. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I was. That's great. Right. You know, I was listening to one of your quotes, uh, one of your one of your speaking, because you're a TED Talk speaker, which I want to talk about that in a minute. But you said, I know what it's like to face darkness, impossible circumstances, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how low you feel, no matter how impossible it seems, there's always life on the other side of pain, and there is always purpose in your pain. Mm. Can we speak into that? We can. I think everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. I think everyone knows that there's purpose in their pain. We just right. don't want to go through the pain right. to experience the purpose. Yeah. Like, everybody wants to test testimony nobody wants a test right and it's it's when you're in the middle of it all you can see is the pain mm -hmm. all you can see is the obstacle all you can see is the challenge you can't see the way out you're in the wilderness you're in the financial storm you're in whatever storm mm -hmm. you're in but it's that little bit of hope yeah that says you know what this storm will not last forever and I believe that little glimmer of hope mm -hmm. is how we experience the light and how we turn our test into testimonies. Amen. Is there a scripture that you just cling, that you cling to during that time? Well, that time I had no scripture. <laughs> that time I just had an encounter that right. awakened me. Okay. Um, now, man, oh man, I have so many. Yeah. I'm just full of the word. <laughs> so it's like now I got so much word that it, the season's not like, in fact, like now when I go through tests and trials and mm -hmm. famines and test them, like wildernesses, now I'm just like, I start. I, I'm, I'm a little crazy Christian. Right, I yeah, get a little good, excited. Good. Yeah. I'm happy because I already know, like, God, nothing happens to me. Everything happens for me. Right. 
And so, man, God will use everything for your good. You know, like there's so many scriptures Absolutely. we could just spit off. It's just, it's full of it. And I think if we could get to that, if, if people could get to that point in their life with their relationship with the Lord, knowing uh, that God is for them, and so he will orchestrate everything for our good and his glory, we would probably be a light, a little lighter on our, you know, a little lighter, a little, that joy, that, un, you know, the unspeakable joy would be able to be bubbling up more than, than not because so many people are so burdened by, yeah. by life. It's what the scripture calls the engrafted word of mm -hmm. God. It goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge to soul knowledge. Right. I mean, you know it, that you know it, that you know it. It's not something you've read. It's not something that you quote. It's not something that you heard some other speaker or right. pastor say. It's something that you know in your soul to be true. Yes. And that is what you build your life on. That is the solid rock. That is the foundation. That is it. That is the truth. The yeah. truth will set you free. You know the truth and the truth will set you free. So fast forward, yeah. the Lord is using your past to help other people live a victorious life. Totally. So let's share what, what you're doing. Man, now. I'm helping leaders get their messages out to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to say like, I want to change the world. I want to change the world. And it was all about me sharing my story and impacting a lot of people, right. helping people overcome mental health challenges and all the things that I did. But what I realized is that I'm just one person and that my story will only reach the former version of myself. Right. How can I empower other Trudys to reach the former Trudys in the world mm -hmm. and other Jacks to reach the former Jacks in the world? Right. So um, I help leaders to do that through putting them on TEDx platforms, mm -hmm. helping them get in speaking engagements and get their messages to the people who need to hear it the most. Right. And so if someone wants to be a, a TED Talk speaker, how, yeah. does that, how does that work? <sighs> Number one, you got to have an idea worth spreading. TEDx is not about talks, it's about ideas, mm -hmm. concepts. Right. Okay, so to distill what your core message is into a concept and idea that can be passed across the world, 37 mm -hmm. million people, it takes some time, but that's the first step, is really get clear on your idea before you try to be a speaker. Right. And to get clear on your idea, you have to be clear on your identity. Oh, say it again. <laughs> say that again. Thank you. It's, it's true, right? I mean, oh. we have to truly know who we are to be able to have that story to touch other people's lives. And we yes. can tell stories, but unless they're God stories from our identity, then. Yes, yeah. yes. One of the scriptures that I live by as it relates to the profession um, is it talks about Jesus spoke as one with authority, yes. unlike the religious scribes. Mm. Okay, religious scribes knew education. Right. Right, they taught what they knew. Very, a lot of people teach what they know. Right. Very few people teach who they are. Exactly. Okay, and that's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that the identity comes before the message, and that's what Jesus embodied. He was the living word, not just the written word. Right, he was, and he was always about his father's business, so he stayed connected to the father, yeah. so he would say what the father wanted him to say, mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, I talk about being a, being a, a sounding clang or a sounding gong. I'm like, yeah. Lord, I don't ever want to be a sounding clang or a gong. I only want to say what the Holy Spirit and the Father is telling me to yes, say. Yes, that's so good. You know? If we could just get that figured out, that would solve a lot of problems. It would. It would. It would solve a lot of problems. Yeah. And you're doing so much. So let's talk about pastor. Yeah. The pastor, yeah. Daryl. Oh, Pastor Daryl, man. It's so funny because I told myself, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to stand up, <laughs> three-piece suit, behind the pulpit, do right. all this stuff. You know, especially having come from an agnostic background. Uh, but they say you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. Yes, absolutely. And so obviously he switched that all up and called me into ministry and called me to be a pastor. And what I learned is that, man, um, I could be myself and still be a minister. Mm -hmm. I could wear a fitted cap. I could wear shoes. I could wear a jacket. I right. could have a kind of edge street style and I could still speak with authority and authenticity, the word of the scripture. And so pastoring for me is all about bringing the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of this earth. Amen. That is amazing. And I think that's true. We can be ourselves and still share the gospel. We oh. don't have to look a certain way, talk a certain way. We just have to love Jesus. Always. We'll be right back with a little bit more here on The Christian View. Don't go away. Hi, and welcome back to The Christian View. We are talking today with Daryl Steinson. Thank you so much for being here. It has been such a pleasure having you. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. You know, you started, you founded um, SecondChanceAthletes.com. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, man. So Second Chance Athletes was formed because I noticed that after following the Lord for some time, that I had found something that I loved just as much as I love sports. Mm -hmm. It was in ministry. It was in serving other people. Um, and that was something that I struggled with for five and a half years, really. Right. I, didn't, I knew I would be successful at something. I didn't think I would be fulfilled by anything. Mm -hmm. And I got to that place, um, and I realized that a lot of my peers were living their current life 
as if it was second best to their former life as an athlete. Right. It was like the glory days and life was downhill from then. Yeah. And I didn't feel like that was God's will for people's life, mm -hmm. like exceedingly abundantly from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Right. And so it, I started to ask the Lord, oh Lord, how did you bring me to this place where I wouldn't trade this life for a, a life as an athlete? And he walked me through what was five phases of transition. Okay, and that became this best-selling book that I wrote, right. and that became um, the launch of Second Chance Athletes, okay. where we give former and forgotten athletes a second chance mm -hmm. to succeed in life without the demands of sports. Oh, I love that. So let's talk about your book. You have a new book coming up. Yes. Um, so the new book is called Speak Naked. Okay. Okay. I know, right? That's um, very vulnerable. It's about vulnerable public speaking. <laughs> That's what it's about. Um, and it came because people were talking about how many, you ever hear that people fear um, death or excuse me, fear public speaking more than they fear yes, death. Yes, yes, okay. yes, that's the number one fear. Exactly. That snake's height and And death. some other phobia, yeah, yeah, right. right. And so they were asking me about that, like right. why would we rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy? And I said, it's because public speaking is like psychologically undressing in front of other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see that. Right. You know, we talked earlier that we're both kind of introverts. Oh, I'm totally an introvert. <laughs> and to be able to speak in front of thousands, you know, that, that takes a lot of inner strength. It takes a lot of surrender. Yeah. Good point. It does take a lot of surrender. <laughs> a lot of surrender. It's like, it's not about me. Right. And that's the truth for anyone's mm -hmm. path. If you think about it, like, God has a way of calling people to something that they cannot do without his help, right. his grace, and his empowerment. Amen. And so a lot of times what makes life so difficult, mm -hmm. what makes fulfilling our purpose so hard, isn't the task itself, isn't the calling itself, it's our resistance right. to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And if we would just learn how to surrender, the path would be easier. Jesus said, my burden is light. <laughs> Amen. Okay, Amen. and that's how that actually becomes a reality. Right, but we carry, we, we just kind of drag it around. We're oh, like, oh, the, the oh, burden is so hard, the oh, burden is so hard, and, and Jesus is saying, just scared. lay it down, just, trust me. Just trust me. I'm so scared, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Oh, oh, who am I? Uh, yeah. And Joyce Meyer says, do it afraid. Do it afraid. Get up there and do it afraid. My pastor um, from my old church, we were at for 18 years, he said, you know, he doesn't like public speaking, but every time he got <laughs> up, he imagined the Holy Spirit going with him. Yes. The Holy Spirit is standing right there with him. And so he goes, I I've got this, not because of me, but because of who's with me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then I heard another person say, you know, we know when we walk into a room, if we're born again believers, who's walking in with us? Mm -hmm. And the power of the Holy Spirit, if, if we allow the Holy Spirit to go in with us, yeah. then it's a game changer. Oh, totally. And I wish, it's funny, we say that so much. Mm -hmm. It's like they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Right. And I just wish, like, my prayer is that people would just really get honest with their belief. Like, do we just quote it? Right. Or do we believe it? And if not, how do we bring ourselves into greater surrender mm -hmm. to the truth? I can tell you one thing that'll help, action. Yes. Do it. I can say all day long, he's, he's with me. He'll give me the words to speak. But right. I have to do this. I have to step on stage. I have to write the book. I have to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And then I get to actually experience his grace and his empowerment Absolutely. in my surrender. And we can rest in knowing that the outcome is up to him. Oh, yeah. When we say yes, when we surrender, when we, we walk forward, he's in control of the outcome. Thank you. And I know, I know. I'm like, okay, did I just mess up what I said? Did I? But God's, he's, he's, he's orchestrating everything. Oh, if, totally. if we let them, if we, if we just get out of his way and our way yeah. to let him work, oh, yeah. which is, that's what you've done. And mm -hmm. you're encouraging and training and equipping other people to do, to yeah. do just that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, it's a lot easier said than done, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. And so did you think years ago, no. sitting in, laid in the hospital room, no. that you would be doing what you're doing today? No way. And if you would have told me, I would have been like, <laughs> like just laughed at you. Right. Cause I, like speaking, no, I'm an athlete. Right. Like no way, but you know, God has a way. Mm -hmm. God has a way. Um, the only thing that I knew early on um, that, I, that is, that I didn't know I always do was write. Right. Like I always had that passion. I knew I would do that. Mm -hmm. And so God is really using that in a powerful way. You know, I always say pay attention to what you pay attention to. Mm -hmm. There was things that I noticed that I uh, would really captivate my eye, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't saved. I didn't have that enlightenment to know that that was God calling me into right. my future. So I want to go back to when, when you got saved. Yeah. We got a couple of minutes. What was the journey like? Was it a, you heard the Holy Spirit and everything just changed and life became normal or it was a seeking with a lot of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. um, I was still having a lot of mental health challenges, so I was seeing a counselor. I was thinking about quitting multiple times. Mm -hmm. 
But I was so hungry to find, like, God, why did you save me from suicide? Right. Why did you stop me from overdosing when I shoved a whole bottle of uh, oxycodones in my mouth? Like, right. why? And that search, um, just I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in professional development just trying to figure it out. I went to, like, every, every sermon, every Wednesday night service, every Christian conference, mm -hmm. just seeking, God, what's your will for my life? And who am I? Right. Like, who are you calling me to be? Like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of that, probably for like five years of right. just toiling and learning and researching and trying and testing and failing until I really hit a sweet spot where it, it, it was it was less, really it was just more surrender. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it was just more surrender, right. more acceptance of yeah. who I actually mm -hmm. am. If we could just accept who we are, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, that's a powerful thing. That is so powerful. And, you know, Daryl, I think that's a tool of the enemy. He wants us to compare ourselves thinking, well, you're not good enough. You're, you can't speak well. You can't, you can't do this good. Look at what they're doing. And that's a tool of the enemy to keep us yeah. in bondage of not really celebrating who Christ created us to oh, be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. If he can keep you com comparing, mm -hmm. then he don't have to compete. Right. Like you'll just you'll just compare yourself to other people and you'll talk yourself out of something mm -hmm. you should be talking yourself into. Like you'll be like, who am I? I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good writer. I'm not a pastor. I'm not this. I'm right. not you. Instead of just being who you are. Right. Nobody can do you like you can do you. That's right. Okay. And God, when he created us, he said it was very good. Of course. Because he created us in his image. Oh, yeah. So if someone's struggling out there with identity, with their purpose, what would you say to them? I would tell them to surrender. Mm -hmm. I would tell them to worship until their soul surrenders to whatever the spirit knows that right. they should be doing mm -hmm. or they should be being. Right. And I'm telling you, worship until those chains fall off. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Just the visual of worshiping and seeing chains fall off. You yeah. Know, just, yeah. I mean, that's powerful. Worship is powerful. And sometimes I think it's a lost art because we're so busy trying to be that we're not just sitting and worshiping and ushering in the Holy Spirit. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Worship is a full surrender. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons we struggle is because we think we have to listen, we have to worship like we do in corporate church. Right. And worship music is a part of it, but sometimes dance is mm -hmm. a part of it. Sometimes journaling is a part of it. Right. To Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be right back a little bit more here on The Christian View. Don't go away. Hi, and welcome back to The Christian View. We've had a great discussion with Daryl Steinson. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Make sure you check out his website. He's doing amazing things in the kingdom and um, greater things to come, I know. Um, thank you for tuning in. We love you. Know that God sees you. He loves you. He has great things for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So stay connected to a Bible-believing church, and we'll see you next time here on The Christian View. Bye-bye.